Okay, so for anyone new joining us, we're just waiting a few minutes for people to get logged on and then we will get started at six. All right, it is 6 p.m. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and hopefully people can kind of straggle in while I'm introducing things here. Uh, my name is Mihaela Nyberg, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at Historic Saranac Lake. Thank you all for joining our program this evening. Um, tonight's talk is part of a series of different talks and programs we're hosting this year that are supported by uh, Humanities New York. Um, tonight we have joining us Tegan Cahoe. Uh, 
Um, and she's going to be talking about her new book, Place of Treatment, Place of Isolation, Place of Community, The Sanatorium in Context. Um, Tegan Coho is a public historian specializing in healthcare and science. She is the exhibit and education specialist at the Russell Museum of Medical History and Innovation at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Her projects there have ranged from an exhibit that used xylophones to explain how anesthesia affects the brain, to a display of the personal items belonging to a World War I nurse. Kehoe's research interests include material culture and interpretation strategies in the history of medicine and the history of scientific study methodologies. So she received her MA in history and museum studies from Tufts University. And real quickly, before I hand it over to Tegan, thank you so much for uh, host, uh, joining us for this talk and sharing your book with us tonight. Um, I do just want to remind everyone to keep your uh, sound on mute during the program. We will get to questions at the end if you have a question that you want to remember, feel free to pop it in the chat and we'll come back to it at the end. But do just remember to keep um, your microphone on mute. We have quite a large number of people on this call, so background noise might interfere. This talk is being recorded as well. I just want to note that. And since we have such a large number on this call, if you're having trouble with lagging or anything like that, I do recommend turning your video camera off and then you'll have an easier time watching Tegan as well. So if you're having any trouble um, because we have so many people on the call tonight, that might help. Um, so without any more delay, I will hand it over to Tegan, shut my own uh, microphone and video off and we will get started. All right. Thank you, Mihaela. And thank you to the Saranac Laboratory Museum for having me. And thank you to all of you for being here tonight. Um, I visited the Saranac Laboratory Museum for the first time in June 2019. And while I grew up in New York State, I was four and a half hours away in Ithaca, and I hadn't heard of the museum until I moved to Boston when a colleague who shares my interest in medical history told me about it. When I visited, I had just signed a contract to write my now new book, Exploring American Healthcare Through 50 Historic Treasures. The book looks at healthcare history by featuring museum artifacts and historic sites around the country. I had a draft table of contents, and I knew that I wanted to have a chapter about tuberculosis. Um, it's a really important story in American medical history and medical history more generally. So I had the Saranac Laboratory in mind. My visit confirmed that this historic site would make a good focal point for looking at the history of TB treatment. The period the site was active spans the time when science was just beginning to understand what causes tuberculosis, up through the period when TB shifted from being a serious threat in much of the United States to being a treatable disease that's more of a threat to specific vulnerable populations. But what I learned as I researched and I wrote my book that I didn't know when I visited the museum at first was the many parallels between tuberculosis sanatoriums and other types of residential healthcare facilities of the era. So tonight I'll share some of what I learned about the patient experience in a sanatorium, but also in a quarantine hospital for Hansen's, Hansen's disease and in a mental health hospital in the same period. For the most part, I won't be using slides this evening, but I do want to start by showing you the location that I'll be describing. Um, and Mihaela, if you could pull those up for me, please. Great. Um, thank you. So here's a photo that I took at the Saranac Laboratory Museum. A big part of staying in a sanatorium was the rest cure, which I'll say more about in a moment. But the proximity to this laboratory was an important part of Saranac Lake for patients. Next slide, please. Um, so this will be a photo of several of the cure cottages that um, made up the Adirondack Cottage Sanatorium. Next slide. This is a photo from the 1940s of the then newly constructed patient housing at the National Leprosarium in Carville, Louisiana, which is another of the historic sites in my book. Next slide. This is a photo of one of the 19th century buildings at the Oregon State Hospital. In addition to having both a current active hospital and a museum about the history of mental health treatment, the campus was the site where One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was filmed. Next slide. And the chapter in my book that focuses on mental health treatment features a straitjacket in that museum's collection that was used at the hospital in the 1960s. 
Um, as I mentioned, it's kind of a combination of objects and historic sites featured in the book. So that's one of the objects, whereas Saranac Lake, I'm using the whole site as the sort of focal point. Um, so that's it for my slides. Thank you for sharing those. Great. So all three of these types of care facilities were places of treatment for conditions that were stigmatized in society. Often they were places where governments, care providers, or both had more control over their patients than over the average citizen. Sometimes for legitimate public health reasons and sometimes for poor reasons, they were places of isolation, but they also had the potential to be sources community, sources of community for their patients. In addition, all three either waned or were in some way significantly altered in the mid 20th century. Despite these similarities, of course, sanatoriums, Hansen disease hospitals, and mental health hospitals varied quite a bit in the particulars, both as individual institutions, but also from one another as categories. My book chapter on Saranac Lake is titled The Cure That Wasn't, in reference to the concept of the rest cure for tuberculosis. For much of the 19th century, poor and working class people living with TB did their best to live with their disease while continuing to work and live at home, which of course furthered the spread of the disease in crowded areas, in addition to putting stress on their bodies. Um, this wasn't by choice, it was, it was the option that was available to them. Meanwhile, wealthy patients took long retreats, sometimes to the desert, more often to the mountains, in search of pure air, which was supposed to be beneficial for the lungs. Dr. Edward Livingston Trudeau stayed in the village of Saranac Lake while recovering from his own tuberculosis, then built a laboratory to study the disease. In 1885, Trudeau opened the Adirondack Cottage Sanatorium to care for working class people with tuberculosis. Um, that was one of the photos in the slide or part of it was there. Um, the rest cure involved getting as much rest and fresh air as possible. Patients rested on porches year round. In winter, they purchased or rented fur coats to keep off the chill. Nurses brought hearty meals and fresh milk with the hope of strengthening patients because tuberculosis patients often appeared to be wasting away. Saranac Lake became a destination for TB patients and independent cure cottages sprung up around Trudeau's laboratory. The rest cure wasn't really a cure, but some patients did recover enough to return to their normal lives. When I visited the Saranac Laboratory Museum, I spoke with a docent whose father had come to the Saranac Lake numerous times as a patient. His TB did finally go into lasting re remission late in life after he also quit smoking, giving his lungs more of an advantage in the fight. German microbiologist Robert Koch isolated the tuberculosis bacterium in 1882. And this proved that the disease is contagious, but it still didn't provide a cure. Doctors at the Saranac Lake Laboratory confirmed patients' diagnoses by looking at their sputum under the microscope to find that bacteria. They also experimented with procedures to drain fluid off of a patient's lung and other procedures that they hoped would help. None of them really got as far as they would have hoped. The antibiotic streptomycin made tuberculosis actually treatable and curable in the 1940s. Koch's, Trudeau's, and others' work on tuberculosis were part of the frenzy of identifying and studying micro microbes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, identifying microbes in the 1870s through the end of the 19th century. And this came after the discovery that living self-replicating microorganisms are what cause infectious disease. Similarly, in 1873, the Norwegian physician Gerhard Hansen isolated Microbacterium leprae, which is the bacterium responsible for the disease then known as leprosy. At the time, the disease, which is now called Hansen's disease, was incurable and it was believed to be highly contagious. In recent years, scientists have discovered that the disease is actually only transmissible with prolonged contact and around 95% of humans are naturally immune because susceptibility is linked with a fairly rare gene. So Hansen's is actually quite hard to transmit. In the late 19th to mid 20th centuries, however, public health response to outbreaks of Hansen's disease was really based on this idea that it was wildly contagious. And it was more about containment than about treatment. Um, early treatment for the disease was largely topical applications of chalmugra oil 
which was a traditional remedy with li limited efficacy. In the 19 teens, a black woman chemist in Hawaii named Alice Ball created an injectable form of the oil, which was more effective and became the standard of care until antibiotics became available. The history of mental health treatment is considerably longer and more complex than the history of tuberculosis sanatoriums or American Hansen's disease hospitals. However, there are a number of parallels between these institutions and mental health institutions in the late 19th through mid 20th century. By the time the Saranac Laboratory was founded, the asylum model had dominated mental health care for about 40 years. Prior to that, many mentally ill people were imprisoned. Many others lived with their families, some of whom abused or neglected them out of malice, poor understanding of their needs, or inadequate resources to take care of them. Better treatment of the mentally ill was one of a number of 19th century reform movements that worked for a more humane society. Inspired in part by similar changes in Europe, American Dorothy Dix campaigned to create state hospitals for the insane starting in the 1840s. Um, and many others joined her, but she's one of the sort of seminal names of that movement. Many schools of thought had seen mental illness as either a personality flaw or some other innate and permanent flaw or problem. But by the late 19th century, it was understood that some mental illness was treatable, which meant that asylums were no longer just specialized places for people with real or perceived mental illness to be housed or contained. They were, at least in theory, places of care. The disorders that some doctors believed could be cured were often termed nervous diseases or neurasthenia. These are imprecise terms that describe what we might today call symptoms of depression, anxiety, or other disorders. Treatment for men was usually intended to get them fit enough to keep up with the demands of modern life. However, doctors believed that women's nerves were literally physically more delicate than men's and that treatment were, uh, that, uh, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so they believed that uh, women's nerves were more delicate and that women were more susceptible to nervous diseases because that connection of nerves and a nervous temperament was thought to be literal at the time. Um, and women more susceptible to hysteria, which is a nonsense diagnosis, which was just a way to um, describe a woman as having mental health problems. Treatment for women was often rest and extreme restrictions on what activities they could participate in. This was another type of quote unquote rest cure, one that typically kept them away from any activity of the mind, whether in an, in an institution or at home. Writer Charlotte Perkins Gilman famously dramatized a woman being tortured by this kind of rest cure in her 1892 story, The Yellow Wallpaper, which was based in part on her own experiences as a patient. In addition to gender disparities, treatment for white people and wealthy people with mental illness tended to be kinder and more solution focused. And for racial minorities and the poor, it tended to be more punitive. Although, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's um, race and class status did not protect her from um, you know, being exposed to a, a treatment that really didn't work for her. By the early 20th century, new schools of thought in psychiatry, such as uh, Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, gave even more credence to the idea that mental illnesses were treatable. But psychoanalysis also sharpened the class divide in how people with mental illness were treated. This therapy was expensive and working class people only had the asylum for treatment. Theoretically, the goal of any healthcare institution is treatment or at the very least symptom management, but it would be simplistic to view these institutions as places of treatment alone. When looking at any of the health conditions that we're discussing this evening, um, the phenomena of stigma, isolation, and patients having decreased control over their lives are all relevant and interrelated. From a modern perspective, the stigma around TB may not be as obvious as the stigma around Hansen's disease or mental illness. And indeed, attitudes toward tuberculosis were more mixed. While all three of the types of sites that we're discussing included isolating patients from their daily lives, their families, and their normal communities, the way in which patients were subject to an unusual amount of control did vary. 
And the response to tuberculosis is perhaps the least direct example, as most of this control really didn't take place at the sanatorium. The attitude towards TB in the, in the 19th century was complex, including both stigma and some mythologizing. Historian Catherine Ott has asserted that in the mind of the public and even the medical community, consumption and tuberculosis were two different things, even though we know that they're names for the same disease. Um, consumption was considered an elegant disease afflicting the wealthy and tuberculosis was a, a dirty one affecting the poor. Among the wealthy in the 19th century, especially before germ theory, consumption was considered a highly romantic way to die. It was long and drawn out, which gave people plenty of time to contemplate their own mortality and make meaning from it. The consumptive look became highly fashionable among Victorians, frail with translucent pale skin and the sparkling eyes and rosy cheeks of a low-grade fever. For women, this was considered very feminine, and for men, it was the tragic look of a poetic soul. Consumption was associated with dying young, and so it had these connotations of innocence, especially in literature. Consumptives were considered angelic or noble. Now, these attitudes may or may not have been shared by the wealthy consumption patients themselves, but they had the advantage of not being treated like they were tainted or like their suffering was their own fault. By contrast, if you were using the word tuberculosis, you were talking about something that was considered this, a scourge of the poor and working class. Um, some people considered it a threat to American society by way of being a threat to the labor force. And others recognized that really it affected all social classes, but scapegoated the poor for the disease's spread. Tuberculosis had become a deadly plague with the crowding, changes in living and working conditions, and faster transport of the Industrial Revolution. Once the US Immigration Service began screening newcomers in 1891, would-be immigrants with confirmed cases of tuberculosis were either turned away at the border or hospitalized there for treatment. People with suspected cases were often turned away for poor physique. Jewish people in particular were falsely reputed to have poor or tubercular skeletal and muscular development. Um, this was often something like a sunken chest and other um, kind of subjective descriptions of someone's body. In 1917, the US Public Health Service ruled that doctors could determine a patient had TB based on their observations of the patient's body alone, even if no tuberculosis bacteria were found in the patient's sputum. This change allowed doctors more power to exclude immigrants on health grounds, although in practice, the exclusion was threatened more often than it was carried out. The other way that structures of power, including government power, affected tuberculosis patients was attempts to control contagion within communities. Some of this was carried out through education, anti-tuberculosis education by public health departments, as well as by nonprofits, included, included a campaign to change the culture around spitting, encouraging chewing tobacco users and people with phlegm to use spittoons rather than spitting on the street. Governments at the local, state, and federal level also tried a wide range of laws to curb TB, from forbidding spitting to forbidding TB patients to marry, although some of these went unenforced. Some cities and towns forbid sanatoriums within their limits as a sort of reverse quarantine to attempt to protect their communities. Others mandated that doctors report cases of TB so the spread of disease could be tracked. This idea of um, mandating reporting of certain diseases is a public health tool that, that comes up in various eras. In the early 20th century, many places passed laws letting officials forcibly remove people who they thought were recklessly spreading disease. And some of these laws gave legal weight to attempts to control the habits and movements of non-white people, immigrants, and the poor. This is again, something that can be very subjective. You know, this person is being reckless in the way they're spreading disease. Certainly we know that some people are reckless about disease, um, but it was also something that could be levied against someone um, when you didn't necessarily have another legal way to control them. And that's what you, that particular government wanted to do. Now the stigma around the disease once known as leprosy really needs no introduction. Um, for centuries, it was considered to be spread by association with sin, 
By the late 19th century, it was also believed to be associated with tro tropical countries, which was an avenue for racist attitudes to be mixed in with the rest of the stigma. One public health official wrote, lepers shun people instinctively, but remain human for a long time. This cruel dehumanization isn't uncommon in descriptions of people with disabilities and deformities, but it was particularly blatant in descriptions of people with Hansons. Um, you know, in reality, they re remain human the whole time that they're alive, uh, but not in that particular person's mind. Several states tried to find found quarantine hospitals for patients with Hansons and met with ire from the communities that the hospitals would be near because of this belief that it was wildly contagious. Um, for example, in 1904, the state of Massachusetts purchased Penikes Island, um, which is off of the sort of southern coast of Massachusetts, to the extent that we have a southern coast, um, to use as a quarantine hospital or a leper colony in the parlance of the day. The state had already chosen two other sites on the mainland, but never built there because of opposition from local communities. In addition to being separated from their families and friends by water, many of the patients were immigrants who didn't share a common language with one another or with their doctors, which made the hospital an extremely isolating experience. Similarly, the state of Louisiana founded the leper home at Carville in 1894. Um, this was following a state law calling for people with the disease to be quarantined. And that law also barred uh, Hansen's disease patients from public transit. So the hospital's first residents arrived on a coal barge because that wasn't public transit. Louisiana also had a hard time finding a location. And so they eventually built the hospital on the outskirts of the small town of Carville, which is 20 mil miles south of Baton Rouge. In 1921, the federal government turned Carville into the Nas National Leprosarium. Other states closed their quarantine hospitals and sent their patients there. In the first decades of the 20th century, many patients chose a new name when they arrived at Carville to protect their families from the stigma of having a relative there. Some families disowned them while others stayed in touch, but the residents were often barred from seeing their families so they could only write letters. At first, the hospital generally treated its residents like inmates. The administrators sometimes punished leaving against medical advice, whether for a night away or as an attempt to leave permanently with a stay in the on-site jail. By the mid 20th century, the strictest rules were loosened in part because of medical advances and improved scientific understanding of Hansen's disease, in part because of administrative changes and in part because of the residents' own advocacy. And the stigma did le uh, lessen meaningfully because of patients' advocacy. And today, patients no longer expect their families to disown them on diagnosis. However, patients' uh, phrases such as treat someone like a leper persist, and the reality of the disease is little known in the US. So if stigma around Hansen's disease is barely noticeable in American society today, it may be because the disease itself is rare on this continent. On the other hand, the wide variety of conditions that fall under the category of mental illness are still highly visible. Present day stigma against people with mental illness is perhaps as varied as the spectrum of mental illness itself. Some conditions, especially in their more moderate forms are understood to be very common like depression and anxiety. People who live with them aren't demonized. On the other hand, the mentally ill as a whole are often characterized as violent and dangerous even though very few conditions are actually correlated with violent behavior. I'm giving this naturally incomplete summary of attitudes today so that we have a basis for comparison with the era of, as of the asylum model of care. In the late 19th and early 20th century, there was similarly a range of attitudes depending on the perceived severity and treatability of the illness, but that range was much more skewed towards assumptions that people with mental illness were abnormal. They were either seen as fundamentally inherently flawed or as responsible for their own conditions and suffering, or paradoxically, both. Receiving treatment for mental illness was also much more universally considered a shameful secret. This only sh started to shift in the mid 20th century. 
Today, one hopes that people actually receiving a diagnosis and treatment for mental illness are being diagnosed accurately. Calling someone crazy because you don't like their behavior is still fairly commonly done in society and in the media. Um, but in the era we're discussing, doctors with the power to make life-changing diagnoses also made these decisions based on whether they approved of the patient's behavior. Some patients checked into mental hospitals voluntarily for care, but others were involuntarily committed by family members, especially if the family had legal power over the patient, as in the case of a wife or an unmarried daughter. Others were committed through the legal system. Involuntary commitment to treatment still exists today, but the range of treatments available is much broader and in some cases much more humane. In the 19th century, women could be committed to asylums for arguing, masturbating, remaining single, a host of other reasons, and people who would today be described as transgender or non-binary were also deemed mentally ill. In 1951, a doctor proposed that enslaved people who tried to escape suffered from a mental illness that he called drapetomania. Um, so those are a couple of examples that show that mental illness was really construed as any failure to, con to conform to the restraints and of the social and moral expectations of mainstream, so of mainstream society. In the first half of the 20th century, the clinical attitude towards mentally ill patients was that they needed to be retrained. This lent itself to control of patients being one of the dominant themes while they were at the hospital. Most treatments taking place at mental hospitals either aimed to soothe or placate agitation or shock the system to snap people out of their condition. Sometimes after a particularly harsh treatment, such as electro electroshock therapy or um, there was an insulin therapy that was very brutal that I won't get into. Patients needed retraining in how to walk and feed themselves. Other times doctors uh, aimed to train them in quote unquote acceptable behavior through systems of rewards and punishment. But still other times retraining meant simulating life on the outside. Psychiatrist Joshua Beerer taught the social approach which centered both patient independence and creating close supportive communities. However, many hospitals that started out with humane ideals deteriorated with cuts to funding and staffing. And this is sort of a cyclical persistent problem if you look at the history of mental health hospitals over a long period of time is people coming up with ideas to make the system more humane and then they're not carried out because of the cuts to funding and staffing. In his seminal 1961 book, Asylums, sociologist Irving Goffman aimed to expose asylums from the point of view of the patients. And he concluded that in practice, even at social approach institutions, patients were typically managed in the ways most convenient to staff. And staff typically used rewards and punishments to uh, control behavior. I'm painting a pretty bleak picture of what it was like to be a patient at a place of residential care in this era. But many of these sites were also places where patients formed vibrant and unique communities. Patients came to Saranac Lake from Latin America, Europe, and around the United States. Many of them stayed in cottages specialized for and by people from one ethnic or cultural group. For example, Black, Greek, and Jewish patients each found community in their own cottages if they wanted to. Among the most well-known of the cottages was run by Alfredo and Alice Gonzalez, from Puerto Rico and Cuba, respectively, who had both come seeking the cure and met and married in Saranac Lake. Their cottage gave rise to a Spanish-speaking culture and an interest in Latin music and dance in the town between the 1920s and 1950s. Saranac Lake was also a refuge from the outside world's prejudices against tuberculosis patients. Although the disease was sometimes romanticized, recovered patients still found it hard to find work or to marry as they were seen as frail and contagious, which was some of the time true. Um, whether that means that they shouldn't have been able to work or marry is another question, but some people did recover enough to get back on their feet and many of them stayed local where there wasn't this stigma to TB because people in Saranac Lake got it. Many of them were re uh, recovered patients themselves. Some of them made a living off of crafts that they had learned in occupational therapy which was a new field at the time. Others became nurses, x-ray technicians, 
researchers or landlords of cure cottages. So Saranac Lake as a village really developed this industry around um, tuberculosis and taking care of people with tuberculosis. And many former patients were joining and expanding that industry. Similarly, many residents expected to be at the Hansen's Disease Hospital in Carville for life. And so they did their best to create community and recreation and independence for themselves, with or without the institution's approval, depending on the year. Married couples, some of whom met at Carville, often built their own small cottages as they initially weren't allowed to live together in the dorm style residences. Um, over the decades, the site had movie theaters, chapels, sports teams, and an annual Mardi Gras celebration. Many residents also did advocacy work from within Carville, um, especially through writing for the residents newspaper, The Star, which was both sort of a community newspaper and an outlet to reach the outside world. It was Carville residents who first advocated for changing the name from the medieval sounding leprosy to Hansen's disease after the scientist who had identified the bacteria. After antibiotics created effective treatments, some people recovered and were discharged. Numerous former Carville residents started to challenge the stigma of their disease in the community more broadly by uh, writing and speaking and describing their diverse experiences. Many of them began this work around the same time as the emerging disability rights movement in the 1960s and 70s. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so they had that um, kind of community and example set for them and something that they could participate in. In most mental hospitals in the time period that we're discussing, Latin dance parties and Mardi Gras celebrations would be considered antithetical to treatment because they were exciting and stimulating, and that was not considered helpful. This doesn't mean that patients didn't make friends and form bonds during mental health treatment, but since so much of the theory behind mental health care was focused on patients' behavior, and care providers often responded to behavior that they deemed bad with isolation within the hospital, physical restraints like the straight jacket that I showed, and dramatic treatment, uh, treatment attempts like electroshock therapy or even lobotomy, patients' opportunities to form community were in part limited by how well their doctors and nurses perceived them to be progressing. Now, when we're talking about patients with a range of conditions from schizophrenia to bipolar disorder to depression, and of course, individual variation between people, it's hard to make generalizations, but very loosely speaking, Patients who were suffering more severely were less able to comply with doctors and nurses' expectations, which meant that they also had less opportunity for community. But where we do see patients with mental health diagnoses forming community in this time period is in the beginnings of broader social movements fighting back against both the stigma and the loss of agency associated with mental health treatment. A subset of the disability rights movement, the Mad Pride movement, wasn't named until the 1990s, but it began as a movement fighting for mental health patient rights in the 1970s. People who celebrate mad pride use the term mad as a reclaimed umbrella term for mental health disabilities. Some of them are also involved with the anti-psychiatry movement, which is a more extremist movement that proclaims that psychiatry really can't be separated from the abuses that have been done in its name but many people who are involved in Mad Pride are more focused on patients having a say in their own care. The work of people like Dorothy Dix and Charlotte Perkins Gilman are historical antecedents to Mad Pride. Of the three categories of care facilities that I've been discussing, neither tuberculosis sanatoriums nor Hansen's disease quarantine hospitals are around anymore. There are still dedicated hospitals for inpatient mental health care although we don't call them insane asylums. Um, and there have been some significant shifts from the model of care that I've been describing. It happens that all three of these types of institutions saw major changes in the mid 20th century. In each case, the availability of new treatments was a big factor in the changes and shifting attitudes towards what good treatment would look like was a contributing factor. The death rate from tuberculosis had already declined significantly before antibiotics. The reason for this isn't certain, but some historians 
suspect that public health measures by both private and government organizations deserve much of the credit. However, when streptomycin became available in 1943, it was a serious turning point in the treatment of TB. Previously developed antibiotics, including penicillin, had not been effective against the disease, but now patients had a good chance of recovery. Within a decade, there was no reason to just hope for the best with the rest cure. Instead, patients could be treated at their local hospital and return home healthy, sometimes within weeks. Their chances of staying healthy rather than having a recurrence of, of tuberculosis from bacteria latent in their system were good. So the entire paradigm of TB treatment shifted. Now, if you know the village of Saranac Lake, you know that the architecture of the area still reflects the history of the cure cottages with porches everywhere. And the Saranac Lake Laboratory was reinvented in 1956 as the Trudeau Institute, studying infectious disease more broadly now that a targeted laboratory for tuberculosis wasn't as big a priority. However, as I imagine many of you know, this isn't the end of the story of tuberculosis. The disease is still a major global threat especially in developing countries, and is a leading cause of death among HIV positive people. In the US, it's largely a disease of the marginalized. It's present on some native reservations, in prisons, and among the homeless. The bacteria can evolve rapidly if the medication re regimen isn't, uh, isn't strictly followed, and strains resistant to multiple antibiotics emerged in the 1980s among populations with poor access to healthcare. Extensively drug resistant strains are not yet considered treatable. Meanwhile, treatment of Hansen's disease was transformed in the 1940s with the discovery of different antibiotics that were somewhat effective against the bacteria. In the next few decades, it improved as researchers found specific antibiotics that were best suited for combating the disease and uh, determined combination therapy of different drugs that together would make the most effective treatment. In addition, it became clear that patients with Hansen's who are doing well on antibiotics are no longer contagious. So patients were allowed to leave Carville once they were in full remission. And that earlier policy of not being able to see their families was revoked. What was once considered a leper colony or quarantine hospital was now just a, excuse me, it was now just a hospital, um, a place for inpatient care but not a place that existed to protect the general population from the patients who were held there. So that's another kind of paradigm shift. But these changes didn't create a mass exodus from the hospital because people had variable rates of success with the treatment, especially people who had been living with the disease for a long time. Um, like a lot of chronic illnesses, um, the success rate for treatment was a lot better if it was caught early. Um, many of the patients who stayed at the hospital in the second half of the 20th century, by medical requirement or by choice, were living with serious disabilities from their illness. Patients who had lived with Hansen's for a long time, um, often because they were diagnosed early but before there was effective treatment, um, had visible signs of the disease, including thickened patches of skin, injuries related to nerve damage, and bone resorption in injured body parts. Um, there's this idea that leprosy causes your limbs to fall off, and that, that has never been a part of the disease that's actually called leprosy. Um, but many patients who have advanced cases um, don't have their full limbs because of the nerve damage and the injuries and then bone, bone resorption afterwards, um, you end up with a lot of damage accumulating over time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it was hard for patients to comfortably reintegrate into their communities. And some patients really didn't feel like they had communities to return to. They spent most of their lives at Carville. Some of them came there as children. Um, but by the 1980s, no new Hansen's disease patients were being admitted as inpatients anywhere. Um, it was all outpatient care. So in the 1990s, most of the functions of the Carville Hospital were transferred to a larger multi-purpose hospital elsewhere in the state. And in 1999, the last residents were given a choice of either moving to that hospital or staying on site, but as outpatients. So like the history of treatment of mental illness, the history of the mid-century changes in mental health care is more complex and harder to summarize um, than the other two examples that we're working with. 
early 20th century trends towards outpatient mental health care laid the groundwork for a system that was less reliant on hospitals. I've already mentioned the advent of psychoanalysis at the turn of the century, and this could, could take place in inpatient in settings, but it didn't have to. Um, while psychoanalysis has been discredited within the broader category of psychiatry and psychotherapy, it did mark a change, um, a positive change, in which treatment for mental health was intended to get to the root of the problem. Meanwhile, more people were growing critical of the way that patients were treated in asylums. In 1913, reformer and former asylum patient Clifford Beers founded one of the first outpatient mental health clinics in the United States. Beers also wrote an extremely influential memoir about his experiences in the asylum system, A Mind That Found Itself. Um, it's quite well written, written. I recommend it if you're interested in, uh, you know, reading nonfiction from 1913. Um, in 1951, it was uh, discovered that a modified antihistamine called clopromazine seemed to cure manic and psychotic states. And so it made patients calm without sedating them. This first antipsychotic came with very serious side effects, um, but it was the beginning of a shift towards helping patients with the biochemical causes of their mental illness, rather than trying to retrain people whose training wasn't necessarily the problem. In addition, psychiatry was moving towards the view that mental health is a spectrum and that most people might experience poor mental health at some point in their lives. The first mental health drugs marketed for everyday anxiety, um, things that had never been considered to require institutional care, also debuted in the 1950s. In the 1960s and 70s, disability self-advocacy and the body of cultural movements that promoted questioning authority and giving voice to marginalized groups started to turn public opinion against the asylum model. Um, both medications and changing views led to a movement towards deinstitutionalization, in which mental health patients are theoretically given the support that they need to live independently rather than in inpatient hospitals. But recent decades have exposed the major flaw in the deinstitutionalization movement, which is that throughout much of the country, patients with severe mental illness don't have access to the support that they do need. Um, many people struggle to get consistent treatment, um, experience recurrence of mental health systems that lead them to reject the treatment that they do have available um, or have more difficulty accessing what could be available. Um, and they lose their housing, work, and other sources of stability and support in their lives. So really creating a robust system of mental health care is a shift that is yet to happen. In sharing all of these stories, there isn't one central lesson that I'm hoping that you'll take away. History is often too complex for that. But as much as I love the scientific side of medical history, the greater part of any medical history story is the social history. And I think that that's reflected in the relationship between tuberculosis sanatoriums, quarantine hospitals, and mental health hospitals. My book is a sampler of 50 different topics within medical history in the US. And in the introduction, I offer some thoughts on framing how to look at these stories as a whole. It can be easy to look back on the treatment decisions and public health decisions that people made in generations past and laugh or shudder at how bad they were as compared with what we know now. In some cases, people's choices were bad because of prejudice, and that shudder is really appropriate. But in other cases, we get more out of the historical stories if we recognize that the people involved were using the information they had, medical, but also social and cultural information, to answer difficult questions. Those questions included what causes disease or unwellness, and how do we alter or prevent what's going on when our bodies or minds are unwell? But also, who can we trust to make health decisions? And how do we organize care most effectively? So whether this is your first time attending historic Saranac Lake programming, or whether this is a part of history that you return to exploring over and over, I hope that the additional context that I've provided this evening helps you better understand the experience of the staff and the patients of the sanatorium and cure cottages. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. I know there's been some activity in the chat and I'm happy to start looking over that now, um, but you're also welcome to um, keep going with questions. 
So do, do feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question and I will try to keep an eye on the chat um, so that we don't miss any um, while we're answering them. Um, we do have a few uh, comments in the chat, um, noting some of the points that Tegan made. Um, and we have a quite long one that just came in um, as well. Getting to the bottom to see if there's a question. Um, noting about um, acknowledging stigma um, and um, you know coming away from from language and things that can add to that stigma and be hurtful to people experiencing certain illnesses and diseases. Um, okay, here we do. Uh, we have another question. Um, how involved were the families in the lives of their TB patients? Could they visit regularly? Um, that's a great question, and I actually know less about that than I do about um, the experience at Carville. Carville was one institution, whereas um, Saranac Lake had both the Adirondack Cottage Sanatorium and the Independent Cure Cottages. Um, so I know less of the, the detail in part because it wasn't as centrally administered. Um, people could visit. Um, I don't know whether sometimes there were restrictions and sometimes there weren't. Um, it was understood that tuberculosis was contagious. And so different families certainly had different kind of risk tolerances for that. Um, but, but that's a really good question because um, that element of isolation was, was difficult for a lot of people. And, um, you know, especially before cars, uh, Saranac Lake is not the easiest place to get to if you're not already in the area of upstate New York. Um, and so that it being a retreat was part of the point, but it was also isolating. Um, I can add to that if that might be helpful a little bit. It would bit. be, thank you. Um, I, I think it did depend also um, about, you know, what families could afford um, if someone had to leave their family and stay um, amongst other patients at a cure cottage or in a sanatorium um, or a hospital setting, depending, depending on what they could afford. Um, but if a family could afford it, they might be able to rent out um, a, a cure cottage independently that maybe was smaller and the whole family might be able to stay. Um, but depending again on where they were staying and what the, the different rules and restrictions for visitors and family were certainly allowed. Um, so it definitely comes back to that the point that Tegan made several times that it, you know, it depended on social and, you know, economic standing and, and things like that. Yeah. And I see that um, Chessie Monks Kelly, who's also of the, um, the museum is, is seconding what Mahela is saying and says, we've heard many stories about relatives visiting their family members, ranging from being able to wave from outside a building to taking a family member out for a meal. So thank you for, for those additions, both of you. Um, we did have another, sorry, go ahead. Oh, did you see another question? Um, how many of the sanatoriums and or other facilities had jails located inside the buildings? How often were they used? Um, that's a great question. Um, so Carville, which, uh, you know, a quarantine hospital for Hansen's disease had a jail. It was a huge campus. It was about 350 acres. Um, so it wasn't, I think it was its own building. Um, but that was also a government facility. So I think that among these private and nonprofit um, facilities, that was much less common. Now, if you're looking at a you know, 19th century insane asylum, there weren't necessarily jails, but um, you know, I'm mentioning those systems of rewards and punishment and isolation or more physical restriction was often used as punishment. And so the, the line between um, being committed and being incarcerated was sometimes deliberately blurred. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm answering every question with it depends, but, uh, but that's because it did. Um, I also noticed someone mentioning that uh, railroad transit made Saranac Lake less isolated than, than we might think. That's a very good point. Then uh, we have, have you done any study of assisted living and uh, memory care? 
Um, great question. I have not personally. Um, it's certainly something that uh, that interests me, and um, I can see why you're asking because that idea of um, you know, caring for people who might need long-term care, might need inpatient care, um, and ways to do that in a way that's truly supportive of the patient. Um, there's a lot of parallels with the types of institution I've been discussing tonight. Um, but um, in the past three-ish years, I, you know, wrote this book on 50 different subjects in medical history, which means that I have a much broader view of medical history than many people, and also means that anything that wasn't within those 50 topics has kind of momentarily flown from my head as I'm recovering from the process of writing a book. <laughs> um, looks like someone raised their hand. Uh, Bruce Campbell, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Not so much a question. I, at one time, worked in a state tuberculosis sanatorium. And at another time, I worked in a state large state psychiatric hospital in the state yeah. of Connecticut, I'm a pharmacist by profession. And someone had asked a question about visitors in uh, sanatorium, TV sanatoriums. And I have um, the, the rules and regulations for the Laurel Heights State Tuberculosis Sanatorium where I worked. Visitors were encouraged However, there were a number of rules, no more than two visitors at a time. Um, and they're allowed only during certain hours uh, at this particular facility between 3 and 5 p.m. Uh, daily and on Sunday. And visitors had to leave the grounds by 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Also, only adult visitors were permitted. Uh, children under the under the age of, I believe it was, uh, I believe it was 15, were not permitted. And these were the rules uh, prior to the introduction of of um, uh, streptomycin and and uh, isoniazid and the other uh, antibacterial treatments for. Uh, tuberculosis. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, and I know that the um, that restriction on um, children visitors uh, was, was fairly common across institutions um, in the, the pre-antibiotic era. Thank you. Um... We did, uh, Chessie just pointed out, I don't think um, we might've missed it at the beginning for folks coming in late, um, but Tegan, do you have a release date for the book or any information on sure. where you might be able to find it? Yes, um, so people who have pre-ordered the book, um, many of them are already receiving it. Um, so at this point, we're in that uh, murky area where it depends on your bookstore, whether we're waiting for the official release date or whether it's already available. Um, the official date is February 15th. Um, but I think at this point, if you if you pre-order pre online, you might get your copy, you know, a week from now rather than, I guess, February 15th is two weeks from now. Um, so long way of saying the book is more or less out. Um, it's called Amer uh, Exploring American Healthcare Through 50 Historic Treasures. Um, and you can find it looking up that title, looking up my name, Tegan Kehoe. Um, it's available on Amazon and through the publisher, Roman and Littlefield. Um, and I have a bookshop.org page. Um, if you just look for my name, Tegan Kehoe. Um, and bookshop.org is a relatively new um, organization that uh, supports authors in local bookstores. And of course, if you have a brick and mortar bookstore that you like to support, I encourage you to look for it there. Um, a lot of uh, bookstores, especially those who have a connection to bookshop.org, would be happy to um, order it if, uh, if they're not carrying it already, um, whether it's uh, you know just, just your copy or if they're looking at ordering it more broadly. I can um, share that link with everyone um, following the talk. Everyone who registered will send out that direct link so that you can do that. Um, and Allison, I see your hand is up, so go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say hi to Tegan because 
I have met you at the Russell Museum with my new vision students. Yes. Um, hello. I'm hello. glad to it's see been, you. Yes. Uh, and for, for others in the audience, uh, Allison is the colleague whom I mentioned when I said that someone else with a, an interest in medical history uh, oh. told me about the Saranac Lake Museum. Um, oh, so one of, so part funny. of my day job is uh, leading field trips um, and coordinating field trips for student groups. Um, and so Allison has brought student groups. So great to see you. Yes. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to put a plug in for people, since I'm assuming people are interested in this topic, to please visit the Russell Museum and to get in touch with Tegan because she can give you a tour, maybe, depending on the time of day, of the <laughs> Ether Dome at Mass General, which is where the first anesthesia, uh, well, was given credit for being given. <laughs> um, and it's a really fabulous uh, opportunity and um, you know, it's just too bad, Tegan, with COVID and everything, we haven't been able to visit. Um, but I was so excited to see that you were doing this talk, and I will definitely buy this book for the classroom. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, and we, we look forward to reopening the Russell Museum and those Ether Dome tours. We're still, because we are part of a, a hospital, Mass General Hospital, we're still waiting for authorization from infection control to reopen. Um, but in the future, we, we will do tours again. There's also a chapter in my book on anesthesia, of course. Um, and if it's not me giving the tour, it'll be one of our wonderful docents. So um, thank you for that plug. Well, I'm excited to get the book for the classroom. I'm going to have to get multiple copies now that I know <laughs> there's a chapter on anesthesia. <laughs> Um, and Chessie just pointed out, uh, we'll be sure to carry it in our gift shop at the museum as well once we're able to get copies. So if anyone can't order it online, um, you'd be able to find it with us down at the laboratory museum um, as well. And then Amy, I know you have a question slash comment, so go ahead. Uh, hi, um, I just want to say hi, Tegan, and thank you so much for doing this. What a, what a great book and great talk. So um, it's just been really, really great to hear this broader context. We really appreciate it. Um, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about occupational therapy and how I imagine that's something that you see um, as an important sort of facet of life in, in these different settings. Sure. Um, so occupational therapy really grew into a field in its own right in the early 20th century. Um, and it was really kind of part of, I'd say a suite of movements or specialties within medicine developing in the early 20th century that were um, looking more at caring for the whole patient. Um, this is also around the time when medical social work started to arise. Um, it's around the time when um, more healthcare institutions that were not religiously affiliated started offering um, spiritual care and a chapel and things like that. Um, so it's, it's part of this sort of movement towards um, what we might now call wraparound supports um, or you know, things that are caring for the whole patient um, and physical therapy as well and sort of the overlap between occupational and physical therapy. But essentially um, occupational therapy when it first started was in many ways similar to what it is today, which is um, helping people with the tasks of daily life and the tasks of work um, in terms of, you know, do I have the physical dexterity to do this? How do I develop dexterity and strength, redevelop it during or after illness or um, alternative ways to approach a physical task um, based on current and long-term limitations? Um, and also using work tasks as a form of therapy. Um, so I mentioned um, in Saranac Lake, people um, making a living off of crafts that they had learned in occupational therapy. So people were learning um, certain metalworking skills, copper crafting and, and really cool, interesting stuff um, as a way to work with their hands and as a way to I wanna say keep busy, but that sounds like I'm denigrating it. And I really mean it in the, the fullest sense, being able to do something other than be a patient, even though that is also part of your therapy. Um, we have a, another question. Um, would you discuss in a couple, um, a couple of the other sites um, or treasures in your book and how you chose them? Sure. Um, 
So about that word treasures, um, this book is part of a series put out by Roman and Littlefield and the American Association for State and Local History. And they're the one who chose, you know, describing things as treasures. Um, and that was a little tough for me because a few of the things in the book are about really awful periods of history. Um, and so are they, are they treasures? But I decided that they are in the sense that they're really important connections to, to these periods and we're learning from them. And so it's the treasure in that sense. Um, so an example is um, there's a set of calipers, um, specifically a um, craniometry calipers. So it's a metal device used to measure the skull um, in the book. And so I use that as a jumping off point to talk about scientific racism. And scientific racism, the term doesn't just mean racism in science, although it certainly was racist. It was um, doctors and other people um, doing kind of science of people. Um, so uh, anthropologists and doctors and biologists um, categorizing people by races and creating the categories of race that we have today because those categories are, are culturally created. Um, and really trying to codify um, making decisions about uh, who was intelligent based on their skull shape, whether you had a more round or more tall skull. Um, and that was also a, a racial distinction. Um, and then all of the uh, sort of consequences of those decisions, because it was, you know, if, if you believe that some races are less advanced than others, if you believe that some races are less human than others, it's a lot easier to justify a lot of um, social ills. It's a lot easier to justify slavery if white people are the pinnacle of human evolution and black people are not. Um, so that's, that's one of the uh, artifacts in the book. Um, I want to, I want to think of a cheerier one, especially since I've been talking about some, uh, some harder, harder topics today. Um, well, this one's just fun. Um, the, uh, there's an artifact in my book that's a beer can and it's from the 1930s, I believe. Um, and it was marketed as sunshine vitamin D beer. And it was beer that was supposedly fortified with vitamin D. It's not really clear whether the fortification process they were using worked, but this was, um, shortly after the concept of fortification with vitamin D was created. That concept was created shortly after the discovery of vitamin D. And this was basically during the first vitamin craze when for the first time scientists were understanding that nutrition, nutrition isn't just carbs, protein, and fat. There are these other nutrients that are really important for health um, and that a number of things that were thought to be, I mean, that were diseases, that are diseases, are actually vitamin deficiencies. Um, and so there was this craze of, wow, is there anything that vitamins can't do? And so um, companies started to jump on this. And uh, vitamin D fortification was uh, developed in Wisconsin. Um, and so you started to see some of the other, uh, or some of the big Wisconsin industries, milk and beer started fortifying with vitamin D. With milk, that's still around, um, which actually makes sense from a biological perspective since it's believed that vitamin D helps with calcium absorption. Vitamin D beer was only sold for a couple of years, but I think it's a, it's just a fun, um, you know, health trends aren't a new thing. And sometimes even what the trends are aren't new. You know, today you don't see as many things marketed with vitamins. You see micronutrients, which is, vitamins and minerals. So it's, it's, you know, these trends keep reappearing. Okay. Um, it looks like we have one last question or comment. I don't know if this was, was maybe a question. Um, and then we'll, we'll try to wrap up since it is after seven. I wonder how many people with TB might've gone to take the care at the sanit uh, sanatoriums versus went there and never left. Mm. That's, that's a good question. And I, I don't know the numbers on that in terms of people who, um, who were able to recover people who, you know, died there and people who recovered, but stayed in the area. 
Uh, it's a great question. And from the museum side, I think that's kind of a, a big question mark for us as well. We don't have um, hard statistics on that. Um, I think we would venture that the majority of people were able to recover, but of course many people stayed in the area. So those numbers um, sometimes get skewed. Um, I'll do like one last call for questions and comments since we've had a, a great chat and great conversation going at the end. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much, Tegan, for um, working with us on this talk and sharing the information about your book. And as Amy said, bringing in um, that broader context to the history of, of healthcare and medicine and public health. Um, I have a list here of things that I learned in your talk that I will be <laughs> adding to tours in the coming weeks as I talk oh, to people about some of these subjects. So um, very fascinating. Absolutely. And thank you so much. Um, for joining us tonight. And then folks, um, we will send out the recording of the talk and I'll send out some information about how to access Tegan's book as well in the coming days. Thank Great. you so much for attending. Yep, thank you all so much for, for being here and thank you for the museum for, for hosting this talk.